it makes me sound like a proper person. But terrifying. Um, hi, I'm really pleased to be here today. Thank you for inviting me and for having Bristol Old Vic as part of this conversation today. It's really, really brilliant. Um, I have lived most of my life in and around Bristol, so my first experience of the theatre, I think, was Cinderella at the Hippodrome, where amazingly the sight of Jim Davidson as buttons failed to put me off theatre for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> And my, lots of my formative experiences um, were at theatres that are in the region. So um, things at Theatre Royal Bath that the school would take us to, um, or Salisbury Playhouse, or venues in and around um, Somerset, and also at Bristol Vic. I was really lucky, um, and, I, and I think it's very important to acknowledge that it was, it was my great good fortune to go to a school that really valued drama education and got us out around the region to see as much as possible. So the first time I worked in a theatre, it was front of house at Plymouth Theatre Royal, and the first time I worked at Bristol Vic, it was front of house, in the immediate aftermath of leaving university. I'd left college with virtually no idea of how I intended to make a living, I think it's not uncommon, um, and it was while working at Bristol Vic that someone asked me if I would like to produce a show. I didn't really have the first clue of what this might mean, but enthusiastically accepted, and that was probably that, really. I'd found the, the, the um, role in which I wanted to work and, and without question, the industry in which I wanted to work. Um, producing is a really funny role because it's one in which there's very little formal training and um, nobody ever really assesses you and you're very rarely subject to any public scrutiny. So um, I, I'm probably not alone in feeling I sort of just make it up as I go along. Um, but suddenly... Um, I'm here, having recently rejoined the team at Bristol Vic in this new capacity. I say recently, it was February when I started, and April when I finished my previous job, and it was August when we finally moved to Bristol, but I'm, I'm hanging on to the newness for as long as I can, because it's a really special time when you join an organisation, when you can see it really clearly. People kind of give you this, the advantage of being new and then just let you kind of get on with it, and, and there's also an expectation that... Um, you're going to come in with solutions rather than more problems, so I'm clinging on to the newness. Um, it's a, a new role um, with, for me, a terrifyingly broad remit. Um, I'm, I'm sort of trying to condense it so that I can at least feel where the edges of this job are. Um, it's a bit like being in the middle of the, the ocean and trusting that there's a shore somewhere but not really knowing which direction to swim in. Um, on the one hand, the task is to support Tom Morris by pouring more resources into planning the work that we produce ourselves and that we programme around it. And um, so I'm very much thinking at the moment about the breadth of offerings that Bristol Vic is obliged by its responsibility to the city to offer and also by the result of its funding. Um, and on the other hand, I'm, I'm also here to think about making the most of the work that, um, that we have made and where it might go beyond our stage and how it might have a future life beyond Bristol. Having not had any experience of programming since my first proper job at the Oxford Playhouse, I'm a bit wide-eyed at the massive task that um, programming the theatre pre uh, presents. I'm really, really passionate about lots of aspects of programming, um, about work for young people, about work that um, truly represents the cultural uh, composition of our city, and about dance, and of course the challenge is to achieve all of those things and more within the quite limited resources for subsidising visiting work. Our programme budget has the ambition of delivering a surplus to the running accounts every year. So between our received work and our own productions, some of which obviously need subsidising, and some of which are uh, conceived de uh, deliberately to, uh, to put funds back into the, the building, there's a very delicate balance to try and strike. Over the last 18 months, we've literally programmed the business out of trouble after a major production drastically underperformed last year. But over the 18 months to come, the balance is overwhelmingly in favour of our own work. Bristolovic celebrates being 250 next year, which is um, uh, an almost unique milestone and really precious. So it's important this year more than ever that we're presenting a balanced programme and using it to develop and widen our audience. Um, I've come from five years at the National, which is a theatre that has an obligation to and the ability to offer something for everyone. And it's an interesting point of reference now that I find myself working in Bristol, where there's certainly the stated ambition to do the same, but simply not the resources to be able to deliver such a huge brief. We don't have the funding, the available theatres, or the depth of audience in a much smaller city. London can offer a, a theatre unique to every type of audience. The Bush can do new writing, the Armida can offer reimagined classics, Tricycle can do political, the Unicorn can exclusively, exclusively offer work for young people. 
Bristol Obvic has to cherry pick from those types of work and establish its own distinct style as a producing house. And it's an impossible task, really, to consistently work at that level and to deliver on such a huge brief. But when we consider the region as a whole, perhaps we can start to think about how we can, between us, cater to all those specific audiences. So this is where the question that I've been asked to consider today becomes really interesting. If we think collectively about how we can all contribute towards a thriving um, and broad ecology across our region, um, um, for our three key stakeholders, our audience, our artists, and our, our staff and personnel. I think we can start to have a really interesting conversation. So in terms of communicating this range of output to our audiences, we probably have to be quite broad-minded about how we deploy our marketing team and their resources. It probably means that the bigger organisations, of which Bristol Obic is one, need to function as more of a hub for the art that's going on in the region rather than standalone entities. I think those are difficult things for us to do, especially when resources are really scant. And certainly we've got a marketing team that are already straining under the burden of, of the, our own programme. But if our websites and our front of house displays were able to direct people to the art that goes on around them and not just inside our own theatre, then perhaps that would be really helpful. We could think about what happens in our, the cities and towns and villages around us. Um, and if we were able to segment our data so that people who are habitually booked for new work or classic texts or dance or children's shows were directed to similar work that's happening at um, other venues, maybe that would be a development. My marketing team would absolutely kill me for stressing this. <laughs> but maybe that's something we need to address in terms of the resources that we've got and also in terms of the really real restrictions of data handling. So what about the benefit to the artists? What might be um, the benefits to them of us working more collaboratively? Bristol Obic has a policy of working with local artists through Bristol Ferment, which I'm glad came up here earlier today, um, which is our artist development strand. And we've also got a commitment to casting local actors in our work, which is it's both morally proper and, of course, it's more economical. Um, I'm working with Tom to prioritise the work of breakthrough local artists on our main stage. But what I'm really interested in is how we can ensure that work with a specific resonance in the southwest is seen as widely as possible. And I've got a really specific example. Every year we send out an invitation to writers in the southwest to submit a script which is read anonymously and from which um, are, are selected five or six writers um, to work with our literary department for a whole year in a way that's entirely bespoke to their needs. There's no prescription for what will come out of that year. Um, it doesn't have to be a finished piece of work and it doesn't have to be for the theatre. It simply is about developing the practice of the individual writer in whatever way they need. And um, for these purposes, the South West is defined as Devon, Dorset, Gloucestershire, Hampshire, Somerset, Bath and North East Somerset, Bournemouth, Bristol, Cornwall and the Isles of, Isles of Scilly, Isle of Wight, North Somerset, Plymouth, Poole, Portsmouth, South Gloucestershire, Southampton, Swindon, Torbay and Wiltshire. Broad church. Um, as a result... Um, of one recent year of work, a playwright called B. Roberts produced a play, and then come the Night Jars, which was ready for production by the end of the year. Brislovic didn't have the resources to fund even a small production of the play, so B. touted it elsewhere, and it won um, Theatre 503's Playwriting Award. Happily, by the time it came to produce the show, Brislovic was in a position to co-produce the production, and it played with us for two weeks at the beginning of this month. Did anybody see it? And? Okay. Good. Great. Um, I'm going for utterly heartbreaking and beautiful. There we go. Um, so it's a two-hander set on a farm during the foot and mouth crisis about the destruction of the farming industry and the decline of rural communities. It was, um, it was really loved by our audience. And across two weeks in our studio, it probably reached about 800 people. I think it's a play that's got mass appeal across our region. People for whom the crisis it describes isn't an abstract historical event, but a real tragedy that they lived through. It's obvious to me that the show should tour extensively to village halls and art centres across the breadth of those counties that I just listed. Now, Bristol Obic doesn't have the resources or the expertise to plan, manage, or deliver such a tour. But there might be someone in this room who does, and there might be someone in this room who knows someone who does. Um, and I think it's not just about night jars. I think there should be a, a network of touring opportunities for a lot of the work that's generated, particularly by our ferment department. We really should be promoting local artists within our community and sharing their voices across the region. I'd love to talk more about this to anyone that's interested. And um, finally, what might be the benefits to us of our staff working more closely? 
I think, again, this could be really exciting. We're all a centre of expertise in one way or another. Um, we should be openly sharing opportunities for learning and staff development where possible. Brislovic has loads to offer. Opportunities to crew on a main house show, to work with our marketing team at delivering a citywide campaign, to shadow the legendary Fred Stacey in our workshop, to learn how to duty manage in a bigger house, to gain experience of producing at scale, come and work with our outreach department and our young company. We could facilitate all those things if organisations could find time for their staff to take a secondment. Um, we've often talked at team days about being a teaching theatre, so I know there'd be huge enthusiasm within the team for offering any kind of professional development on that sort of scale. And I'm sure there'd be people within our team who could identify reciprocal opportunities that they'd be keen to explore elsewhere. The really brilliant thing about the theatre industry, and I've been struck by this many times over the last year, since leaving my very narrow focused role at the National and engaging again in the wider community across the country, is how supportive and how non-competitive it is. Yes, there are moments when, for example, sister organisations like Bristol Vic and the Tobacco Factory have to be really careful not to programme across each other and to compete for audiences. But in general, no organisation needs to achieve its success at the expense of any other. It's good for Bristol when Bath Theatre are doing well, when the Tobacco Factory is doing well, and when other local venues are making good work. It's good for all of us when the standard of theatre is generally high and reliable. It gives audiences the confidence to keep coming back and to try something new. It's also amazing how willing we are as a community of colleagues to share advice, to try and develop projects together, to pool our ever-diminishing public subsidy and find new ways of making it go further. I think we work in an amazingly generous and broad-minded industry. And the reasons that I see goodwill fail are often to do with the huge remit that we all now have and the very real limits of time and energy. I certainly speak for myself when I say that my good intentions are hampered most often not by scant resources, but more often by the sheer scale of my remit and the fact that I just can't do it all. Um, I hope that that's an admission of non superhumanness that many people also share. Um, I say this partly as a note to myself, not to get carried away with lots of brilliant ideas, but we shouldn't waste this precious energy that we have got in lots of fantastic sounding but ultimately undeliverable ideas, possibly like some of the ones I've talked about. But we should think about what will genuinely be really efficient and valuable for us all to get engaged with and what will make the most differences to our audiences, our artists and our staff. <laughs>